Eben Alexander is a writer and speaker who formerly spent 25 years as an academic neurosurgeon. In 2008, he was driven into a week-long coma and upon awakening, remembered having a spiritually transformative near-death experience. His books include Living in a Mindful Universe and Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife. Timestamps are in the description and we hope you enjoy the episode. So, Eben, before we talk about your near-death experience, please tell me a little bit about your background and who you were before that experience. Yes, well, it's great great to be here, Ben. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, who I was before. Uh, I'd spent 54 years of my life before my coma, before my near-death experience, mm. owning a very, very kind of conventional scientific worldview. Now, it's important to point out, though, that my uh, father, my adoptive father, um, was very important in my life. And he was a globally renowned neurosurgeon. And uh, he had been through World War II as a combat surgeon. I still have his uh, little pocket Bible of New Testament and the Psalms that he had carried through the Pacific Theater with him during World War II. And I think that's one of the reasons he came back relatively unscathed, was he have, had a very strong a belief in a loving personal God and the power of prayer. And th th that was a set of beliefs that accompanied him all through his career in neurosurgery, where even though he was uh, educated in the highest forms of modern uh, kind of conventional science, um, that never threatened his belief in a loving personal God. Now, like many who grew up in the 60s and 70s, I always knew that science is the pathway towards truth. And I'm more of a scientist now than I've ever been. But I also came to recognize that um, materialist science, that is kind of that Newtonian determinism that had been around for centuries, which is essentially what still uh, dominates kind of our cultural uh, view of science, uh, yeah. was false. Uh, you know, the notion that only the physical world, uh, the material world exists, and that somehow the brain must muster consciousness out of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes going on in this three and a half pound gelatinous mass floating in a warm, dark bath in my inside my head is somehow creating this entire uh, mental reality that I experienced is just not true. Uh, and this was the lesson I was to learn in my near-death experience. It was very profound. And in fact, I've spent the last 14 years since my coma experience working with uh, hundreds of other scientists around the world uh, in an effort to more broadly kind of elucidate, define, and understand all of these uh, uh, phenomenal aspects of human experience, mm. near-death experiences that have been going on for thousands of years across all cultures. Uh, but instead of just denying this evidence and debunking it and pretending it doesn't exist, why don't we take this evidence and actually uh, really run with it? And that's exactly where I think the modern uh, world of consciousness studies and the science of consciousness is headed. And I'm very glad that my coma experience has allowed me to contribute uh, in a significant fashion to that discussion. So uh, it's been a blessing all around. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such important work kind of pushing, pushing these topics and these phenomena and these things that happen out to more people because more people need to become aware of it. Absolutely. Um, what were your views on religion like in your earlier days, again, before the, the ND, before your experience in your coma? Because you mentioned your, your father, but I, I suppose he was religious, like Christian, or did, was he kind of believed in his own God? And how did that affect you? Yeah. Well, I would say my father uh, kind of went along with the, uh, uh, he had grown up in a Presbyterian church in Eastern Tennessee. When I was a child, he was taking me to a Methodist church. And then when I hit adulthood, I kind of shifted over to the Episcopal Church. Uh, but I would say my father's view was fairly conventional, although he did have uh, a lot of trouble with the concept of the, of the resurrection. He wasn't sure how to interpret that. And I think I've come through with uh, what I view as a far more facile and uh, workable uh, explanation of the reincarnation that was really that Christ had a light body uh, uh coming back to life. And uh, so in other words, it was not a physical body. Um, mm. and, and to me, that explains so much more. And I think my father would be very satisfied with that explanation. And that also points out how near-death experiencers commonly show us, and after-death communications commonly show us, that our loved ones are still present after they've left a physical body, but they often appear in kind of a young ideal state. 
that's exactly how I encountered my own, own father's soul uh, two and a half years after my coma journey during a very deep meditation. That's something oh, wow. I describe in complete detail in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Um, but uh, I would say that what I've come to realize is that uh, in many ways, uh, to the extent that any religion focuses on unconditional love, compassion, kindness, mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness, uh, that that religion is aligned very deeply with the most profound lessons of near-death experiences. But as soon as a religion starts to veer away from that kind of what I would say is the fundamental message of the prophets uh, to emphasize love and kindness, compassion, and taking care of others, and a non-exclusive approach uh, to that unconditional love, um, you know, if a religion varies away from that, it is definitely going away from the truth that the original message of the prophets was trying to tell us about. So it really, in my mind, is just a way of, of, of saying that you don't have to buy into any kind of ideology or scripture that's thousands of years old, even though those can be valuable sources of some truth. But unfortunately, the way the ideologies are pressed by people, they often lead to a lot of conflicts. Uh, I love there's a book by my colleague, uh, Christopher Copps, C-O-P-P-E-S, it's called The Essence of Religions. And in that book, he actually compares the five major modern faiths on the world, uh, the Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, as well as Hinduism and Buddhism, and compares them with the deepest lessons of near-death experiences. He's basically using near-death experiences as kind of the uh, the tip of the spear, the the gold standard by which to uh, evaluate any other religious beliefs. And I think he does a very good job in that of helping us to focus on the lesson that I think most near-death experiencers would agree on. And that is that it's all truly about love, kindness, compassion, mercy, taking care of each other. And the yeah. more our modern world can come to realize that the science of consciousness is actually pushing this agenda of kind of one mind and that we're all in this together, uh, and it takes that golden rule, you know, of the life review, life reviews, your life flashing before your eyes have been part of near death experiences going back at least 2400 years. Uh, and in many ways, that is what religions have tried to teach us is the golden rule, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. And essentially, that's the deepest lesson of the life review. Because life reviews and NDEs, there are two unusual features that people should acknowledge that come out of the scientific study of life reviews. Uh, one is that it's uh, lived from the perspective of others. In other words, if you've handed out pain and suffering to others, in your life review, you experience that on their behalf. You're on the receiving end of whatever you are handing out. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very important aspect of the life review. The other important thing is that about 45% or so of people will say it's actually like reliving the events, not just a mm. memory of the events. And I think that's very important because it shows us that that realm of these spiritual encounters of near-death experiences, for example, is a realm that's completely outside of space and time. And it's a realm where your entire life can literally be seen instantaneously before you and mm. offer up certain lessons of, of learning and teaching and growth and transformation. Uh, but that only occurs because it's not just some vague remembering, but an actual reliving uh, and doing so from the emotional perspective of others around you uh, who perceived your various thoughts and actions. So those are very crucial uh, elements of the life review, showing us that in essence, we are truly sharing the dream of the one mind, uh, which is where our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, the third book that was co-written with my life partner, Karen Newell, uh, that book came out in 2017. It's a strong argument, multidisciplinary argument for the scientific consideration of the one mind or primordial mind hypothesis. Yeah, that's fascinating. And like you said about the life reviews where you, you feel on behalf of the people that you've caused pain and suffering to and all that. I, I, I've come across that quite a few times and I think that's, I think it's fascinating. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And so in a way, I hope that that is, what's going to happen you know to to most of us or all of us in some way although there's obviously evidence to suggest that not the same thing doesn't happen to everybody um but just tell me again so you because i was a bit confused your religion when you were younger like before your nd so were you 
were you personally a Christian or was it kind of, was it just science for you or how, how was that? Well, as I said in the, you know, back there in the 60s, 70s, I knew science was a pathway to truth. In fact, I remember in my sixth grade confirmation in my Methodist church, I was kind of lecturing my Sunday school teacher about the Big Bang and about the origin of the universe from the modern scientific perspective. So I was always pursuing science as pathway to truth. Okay. And I know now that that is the case. But the reality is materialist science is what died along the pathway. Uh, physicalism, the notion that only the physical world exists, that somehow consciousness is created by the brain, that's the part uh, that dissolved. And for my own personal uh, beliefs. You know, I wanted to believe all that I heard in that Methodist church, you know, given that I had a scientific background. I wanted to assimilate all that into one worldview that could accommodate all of it. But through much of my career, and that included uh, 15 years teaching neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School, I really uh, had great uh, doubts and confusion about how conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. And I think that's one of the reasons why I had to go through such a profound near-death experience was because it offered me full well in the form of this severe case of gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis, which should have disabled all of the capability of any dream or hallucination in my brain because it basically took out the neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, the part that makes us human. Uh, and meningitis is a perfect model for human death. And I had a very severe case as is pointed out in a medical uh, review of my medical records. It's a case report in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases. It came out in September 2018. It was by three doctors not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. Uh, and it's uh, Dr. Serbi Khanna, Lauren Moore, and Bruce Grayson. And they strengthened the arguments that I made in the book, Proof of Heaven, but they spent a lot more time going through my medical records objectively. And uh, basically they came through with two major conclusions in that case report. One is there's no way my brain, brain could have uh, harbored any kind of dream or hallucination. It was far too damaged. Mm. So how did I have the most elaborate, rich, detailed, memorable, transformational uh, and impactful set of events to occur in my entire existence as occurred that week when my brain was demonstrably offline. That was the first conclusion that's just a shocker uh, of no end. The second is where did this recovery come from? Yeah. Uh, you know, my doctors had estimated I went from a 10% chance of survival down to a 2% chance during that week in coma. Uh, and then, but with a 2% chance of survival was no chance of recovery. They didn't know of any cases in the medical literature of someone that ill from a gram negative bacterial meningoencephalitis coma for a week with all the lab parameters and neurologic exams that I have showing the Glasgow coma scale of basically six to seven, probably down to five. Anything below nine is deep coma. You or I would have a 15 right now. Um, and three is a score for a corpse. So, uh, you know, getting down there to six or seven or even as low as five as I did in my coma, uh, and with it being bacterial meningoencephalitis, which was affecting all lobes of my brain, you really have great trouble seeing how I could come through and over two months have this kind of recovery uh, yeah. to where I really, you know, in fact, my memories were more complete after the two month time point of, of return of memories than they had been before the coma. All wow. of that is a tremendous mystery uh, that uh, completely flies in the face of the simplistic concept that consciousness is created by the brain and that our brain serves as a repository of long-term memories. That mm -hmm. simply does not appear to be the case. And so my journey very specifically uh, argued against my conventional materialist understanding. And that's where I think my story has garnered so much attention from the scientific community, uh, which looks at my case is quite valuable in trying to answer this question about the mind-brain relationship and the nature of consciousness. Yeah. Wow. And I, I can't wait to hear you tell me about it in just a moment. The last thing I'll ask you before, before we do kind of go into that in a bit more detail, into your actual experience, is prior to your 
Andy, prior to your near-death experience, had you come across anybody, and I don't mean like had you seen it mentioned on a TV program or, or whatnot, somebody mentioned it in passing, had you come across somebody, were you aware of anybody that had had one, either a patient or a friend or colleague or whatever, anybody that had either had an ND or was yeah, very clued in? Like, Did you have an opinion on the phenomenon prior to well, your experience? Well, I did have an opinion, and in fact, I shared some of that in the book Proof of Heaven. Uh, for example, I share in there a story of, of a, a family that I was I was treating several generations of this family for uh, various conditions that included metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the daughter had this beautiful dream that involved her departed father and his soul. Uh, and he left her some clues in the form of a, a particular hat. I, I won't tell the whole story here. Uh, people can enjoy it if they read Proof of Heaven. But the interesting thing is the daughter gained information from the father uh, in spiritual form after he had passed that she could not have possibly known. And her mother knew that. And that's where this extraordinary kind of revelation to the daughter uh, kind of helped her break through. And she had her own threatening illness in the form of metastatic uh, cancer to her brain, the daughter did. And she was wrestling with her own mortality. And this particular uh, set of events where she encountered the soul of, of her departed father helped her to come into recognizing the reality that he was still there, uh, that he gave her this information that her mother knew, but she couldn't possibly know. Uh, that was truthful. And I think those kind of things, people, patients would tell me those kind of stories. Uh, and I would pat them on the back and reassure them and say, well, we just don't know. And and I really did, didn't did know all the answers, certainly. But uh, at the time, I remember smugly thinking that, you know, the brain uh, creates consciousness. So this had to be some hallucination, even though I couldn't explain how uh, she, the daughter had this uncanny ability to glean the deep truth from this apparition of her father, of information that her mother could confirm. Uh, and to me, it was an astonishing story. And there were others like that, that I share uh, not only in Proof of Heaven, but also in our second book, The Map of Heaven, and also in the third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, which is more my personal story of unfolding. Uh, additional uh, kind of uh, extraordinary uh, experiences of consciousness that really defy explanation if you're trying to um, uh, just to honor kind of materialist assumptions about the nature of reality. So all of it's been a tremendous gift, but I would say my NDE opened my eyes and my mind tremendously to much grander possibilities, which is where I think the answers will lie. Yeah. And so your life has, has kind of been in two halves. Like it's been a different journey since that that experience, I suppose. And all those books that you just mentioned, of course, will be, you can find them via the description below. So if anybody wants to find them, just scroll down and there'll be some links there. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's a good time that maybe we start talking about your actual experience. Um, do you normally kind of just tell it all as one kind of thing? Or I was wondering whether it'd be easier, maybe, or not easier necessarily, but interesting to hear just a quick brief kind of um, overview of the physical side of it. Like, you know, like what it, what happened to you physically when you were unkind, when you lost consciousness, when you regained, and then to, to kind of rewind and go through the spiritual side of it. But if that's going to be too complicated and you just want to tell it no, all I, in I, your... Yeah, it's fine. Why don't we just start that way and I'll just, I'll kind of lay it out there and also try and be kind of efficient with it so that you can then dive back in with questions about specifics concerning that uh, narrative of my experience, if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. And I'll try uh, not to interrupt you unless I have something burning through, uh, burning through my brain and I can't help myself. Um, but yeah, I'll, okay. I'll try to give you, give you the, the free time to, to go with it as you want. No, no rush, but yeah, just be natural. I'm just, well, uh, I'll, I'll just to... frame it up by saying what it looked like from the point of view of the outside world for my family, mm. for example, because yeah. what they saw was I woke up, you know, four 30 on a Monday morning with, uh, severe uh, back pain, uh, thought I could take a warm bath to get rid of it. That didn't work. Could barely make it back to the bed where I collapsed, writhing in cold sweat and pain. And, and soon realized when my 10-year-old son, Bon, came in and started rubbing my temples, it felt like he'd driven a white-hot spike through my head. And my family thought I was you know very ill, but I urged them, do not call 911. You know, I'm a doctor, trust me. Uh, doctors are terribly embarrassed to be taken to the emergency room. Uh, and I was not about to do that. I knew I'd get better if I was just patient. Uh, I didn't realize, but uh, I was already going downhill fast. I mean, any yeah. medical professional hears of severe back pain, headache, you know, 
uh, would think, think meningitis. Well, my family left me to rest. I, when they checked on me an hour or two later, I was having grand mal seizures. That's when they called uh, the ambulance to come to the house and pick me up. I remember none of that. I was gone from this world for the next seven days. Uh, they did take me to the Lynchburg General Hospital emergency room where uh, I was uh, fortunate to encounter Dr. Laura Potter. She was very quick to realize I might have meningitis to lumbar puncture. Out came thick white pus under pressure into that needle put into the cerebrospinal fluid space in my lower back. Uh, and she told me months later that when she saw that and got the report back from the lab that it was gram negative bacterial uh, meningitis, she knew I was in deep trouble. Going into coma over three and a half hours with that diagnosis, uh, that's where that uh, initial estimate of 10% chance of survival came from. They put me on three powerful intravenous antibiotics on a ventilator up on the medical ICU where I languished for a week. Uh, and then when they held a family conference uh, on day seven of coma, where they weren't seeing any signs of recovery, it looked like uh, the best thing to do was to take me off antibiotics and let nature take its course. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the way it was. And uh, uh, it was uh, within a few hours of that decision that I started coming back to this world. But when I did, my family's worst fears were realized because my brain was so wrecked. Uh, you know, I, I seemed to be coming back, uh, you know, saying a few words here and there, but I was obviously in and out of a crazy, paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare, which lasted for the next 36 hours after they pulled out the breathing tube. Uh, that's very interesting in its own right uh, when we compare memories, because the deep, profound spiritual memories from the coma journey are as sharp and clear in my mind today as if the whole thing happened yesterday morning. Whereas those paranoid, uh, delusional, psychotic nightmares in the 36 hours after I came out of coma, those disappeared within a week or two. And that's a very important distinction between the kind of memories we go through. And it points out these are not psycho psychotic, delusional, nightmarish uh, visions that people have in an NDE. They're a completely different, far more powerful, memorable, detailed um, set of awareness. And that's what was so shocking to me. But I only came to realize that in the weeks and months after my coma as I was recovering. Yeah. Now, important in getting into my coma story to point out there's an atypical feature of it and that is that i had no memory of evan alexander's life when i went into this coma and during those seven days of coma i had absolutely no memories of humans this earth i mean everything was gone except what i experienced in the coma itself uh and that was a, a beautiful uh, kind of lesson of, of kind of spiritual existence and reality uh, but important to point out that that amnesia was operative really until I came back to this world uh, and only in the hours and days after coming back did a lot of my Evan Alexander personal memories start returning to me. And as I said, by the end of two months, those memories had returned even more complete than they had been before coma. Now, diving deep into the coma experience itself, the yeah. first thing I noticed uh, was what I call the earthworm's eye view. It was a primitive course on responsive realm. I had no body awareness during any part of any of this. Like I said, I had no memories of, of earth or my life or of humans, none of that. It was an empty slate, which I think was important for some of the deeper lessons I was to learn from this. Now, so it was uh, dark that, and everything. It, it was, was very dark. And I, I remember kind of tactile sense of roots or blood vessels all around me. Uh, there was this pounding, monotonous sound. It just seemed to go forever and ever. And it, it sounds foreboding for me to discuss it. But at the time, I just thought this is existence. This is what is. So it was not anything that generated much in the way of any kind of fear. Um, and the good news is it did not last forever. There came this slowly spinning white light out of the mists. And it came towards me, uh, and I noticed it had a perfect musical melody. And that was one of the most beautiful aspects of this was music. And the way I experienced music and sound was very kind of uplifting and refreshing and invigorating and in many ways enlightening. Music kind of led the way, and it's how I navigated these spaces. Um, and I remember uh, that portal, as I called it, uh, that uh, came with this uh, musical melody opened up like a, a, a wormhole, really, up into a rich, ultra real uh, gateway valley. That was kind of the second phase of my journey. Much more real than this world. That's something that people uh, 
who have heard about NDEs but haven't had one are confused about, but they, they might often think that such experiences occur in kind of a murky, dreamlike world. No, this world, this material world is murky and dreamlike. That world is absolutely sharp and clear and crisp and alive and uh, amazingly meaningful when you when you experience it. And it, in fact, it's one of the reasons you often hear that near-death experiences are ineffable, indescribable. Mm. Well, part of that is that ultra reality. And remember that that realm, that gateway valley, that's where we would reunite with our higher souls, reunite with souls of departed loved ones, go through life reviews, uh, witness all of that in that context of that beautiful, infinitely loving God force that is so obvious as a presence throughout that realm and the higher spiritual realms. And I remember witnessing all of that because I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Uh, now, of course, some scientists complain when I get to this part of the description, but I'm I'm just sharing what I went through, uh, yeah. what it was. Uh, you know, I'd never really read the NDE literature before, uh, and my oldest son, who was majoring in neuroscience at the time in college, is the one who advised me when I was two days out of the hospital, and he came home from school, gave me this big hug, and said I was far more present than I'd ever been. There was like, there was a light shining within me. That's what he told me later. But what I told him was, it was all way too real to be real. That was my interpretation, because my doctors had already told me that I was uh, horribly sick. You know, my brain had been soaking in pus. They couldn't understand how I was coming back to this world. Um, but for me, I took their, you know, the doctor's lesson was, uh, you can't believe any of it because the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks, but I didn't yet know my neurosurgical knowledge had not yet returned yeah. to me. And I also had not reviewed my own medical records enough to know just how badly damaged my brain was. So that advice was, uh, you know, not very well founded to just forget about it. And my yeah. older son told me at that time, Write it all down before you read anyone else's near-death experience. That was the best advice I've ever gotten. I wrote about yeah. 20,000 words over the next six weeks. And only then did I dive into the NDE literature, where I was shocked to find uh, a lot of similarities with my journey. Not you know, things like butterflies and various colors, but the nature of the journey and the power mm. of kind of this unfolding in space and time, and uh, that one could witness you know, the events of one's life uh, unfolding uh, in a life review. Now, given my amnesia, I could not have an Eben Alexander life review, but I did experience life review as this journey pr uh, proceeded, uh, because what I then witnessed uh, was that I was not alone on the butterfly wing. There was a beautiful young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbone, high forehead, uh, and a broad smile. She never said a word. She never had to. Her message to me was delivered uh, as this kind of mental, emotional a uh, message of oneness. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply cared for. And I cannot tell you how reassuring that message was mm. at the time. In fact, I'm convinced that was the main message I was to bring back uh, to this world. But in that beautiful gateway valley, um, you know, there was this soft summer breeze that blew through and it was my uh, you know, given my amnesia and, and kind of complete lack of any memory of human knowledge or of life on this earth, et cetera, that wind was what I later called the divine breeze or the breath of God. That was my first awareness of that very unifying uh, love of that God force, that co-creative force. And there was nothing judgmental about this force at all. It was completely loving and accepting uh, and honoring of, of my soul journey. And so what you realize is that life reviews happen in that environment with that infinitely loving force. So any kind of greed or, or uh, selfishness, any pain or suffering we handed out to others in the light of that love appears to be especially uh, you know, ill-suited to our soul journey. Everything mm. uh, in that ambience lines up with this beautiful loving force that seems to be such a presence. And that's why the life review can be so powerful, especially if you've handed out a lot of pain and suffering to others, where it, it basically takes on hellish characteristics. And I think most people who describe hell in these journeys are really describing life reviews where they've handed out so much pain and suffering to others that there are hellish aspects to their uh, to their life review um yeah. 
but at any rate, uh, this this journey for me was just beginning to unfold. Uh, and what I witnessed were thousands of beings down below us dancing in this meadow. Uh, as I said, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing, millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling. In vast, all those souls uh, between lives dancing below, that's what I came to label that whole uh, kind of activity of, of joy and festivity. And there were children playing. Did they look human, the, the, the beings, the souls below? Yes. And yeah. it was all being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of uh, of angelic choirs that were emanating chants and anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness. Uh, and that's when what I witnessed next was all of that collapsing down. I remember four dimensional space time, the material realm, all of that collapsing down. Then this whole different ordering of uh, kind of causation, the place where life reviews could happen, that gateway valley with a whole different ordering of time, what I call deep time or meta time, that allows for things like your entire life to flash before your eyes in a temporal setting, because there's a grander temporal setting that can encompass all of that and allows for the transformation of soul, evolution of all consciousness, et cetera, that much bigger idea of time, but seeing all of that collapsing down. Uh, to what I call the oversphere as I entered what I call the core. And the core was an infinite inky blackness, but it was filled to overflowing with the divine love of that creative source, that God force. And I came to realize, I came back to this world calling that divine force Aum, because that was the sound I heard in that realm. And I realized that if you try and label this force as God or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Great Spirit, whatever, you're trying to own it, label it, define it uh, in ways that just don't suit to the power of that infinitely loving God force. Uh, and so that's why, for me, the word awe made, made a lot more sense. So like and A-H, A-H is that, uh, sorry to interrupt you. It's just I'm just trying to visualize like, the sound. It's like ah, just like that, is it? It was like an alm, and a completely uh, kind of opening orbital alm. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, a deep, it's something I use in meditation all the time now because I use yeah. sacred acoustics meditation to go back into deep, uh, uh, deep uh, dives into uh, not only recovering memories from this, uh, but from developing ongoing relationships with the various. Uh, you know, guides, spirits, uh, that beautiful guardian angel uh, on the butterfly wing with the sparkling blue eyes. She came to be of crucial importance to me uh, in the months after my coma, uh, as it is told in the book Proof of Heaven. But getting back to my story, uh, deep in that core realm, uh, and every time I'd enter the core, I was told conceptually, not in any kind of verbal description, but when I wrote up the words later, you are not here to stay. We will teach you many things, but you'll be going back. And in fact, I'd come to believe that going back was simply going back uh, to that earth where my view, because that's where I would tumble down out of this sanctum sanctorum of the divine in the core. But the reason I mentioned the core is I did not have an Evan Alexander life review, but I had a more generic uh, kind of uh, uh, major objective overview of the whole process of life reviews and reincarnation uh, in two forms during my journey, both mm -hmm. of which I encountered in the core realm. One was called the, the I call it the uh, flying fish version. And basically it's as simple as it sounds when we're in these incarnate, in these physical bodies uh, with our brain serving as a, basically a filter for primordial consciousness to experience. Uh, we, we are dumb down, we do not have mean lives, lives. Uh, and that's what allows us to have skin in the game to live these lives uh, and to learn and teach these lessons we're here to learn and teach. But then, of course, we come up out of the water. That's when we leave the physical brain and body of death, reunite with higher soul, uh, uh, loved, souls of loved ones, uh, go through life reviews, then plan next incarnations. But there was another later vision of life reviews and reincarnation that was far more profound. It's what I call the Indra's net version. This happened on another subsequent passage through that core realm. And it was this uh, fantastic vision uh, where that complex oversphere of the universe through all eternity got used to in the core realm 
expanded to show me this uh, uh, incredible capability of these interwoven threads. And the threads really showed our incarnation and then between lives, incarnation between lives. And it was almost like breathing inhale and exhale as our souls work towards uh, this process of oneness with the divine through multiple incarnations. And it's not quite the, say, the Buddhist interpretation of reincarnation, where it's a blind wheel of suffering that you're trying to get off. But in mm -hmm. fact, this is filled with grace, this Indra's net vision that I saw of these interwoven threads of our lives, of sentient beings, learning and teaching each other and going through these phases of the program forgetting, and then the knowing and the program forgetting getting all this process of learning and teaching each other and trying to grow towards that oneness with the divine and our understanding, that is the bigger kind of vision I had for the purpose of life, this transformation of all consciousness, evolution of consciousness, as Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote about in his mid-20th century book, The Phenomenon of Man. But that is what I saw unfolding. And so I would go through these multiple layers that I've described, Earth were my view, the the beautiful gateway valley, and then the core realm multiple times, uh, all in the process of, of learning and teaching these lessons. And of course, that has been the subject of so much of what I've done with meditation to go back in uh, to recover even more of that, because uh, much of my work in sound evolved from the recognition that sound was so important uh, on this journey. It's what I used as a vehicle to traverse these realms, remembering the musical notes of, uh, of these various uh, musical experiences is what helped me to conjure up these portals uh, to use wow. again and again in this journey. And then there came a time, though, where just as they promised me the first time through the core, you're not here to stay. And the way that manifested was on another descent down to that earth where my view, when I tried to conjure up the musical notes and the melody, they no longer worked to bring in that light portal that took me up into the gateway valley. To say I was sad at that point would be an understatement, but I also knew I could trust that the universe would take care of me. I've been promised that on multiple passages through the butterfly wing, through the core, that I would be cared for. And I knew that to be true. And that's what uh, ended up unfolding. And now I saw thousands of beings going off into the distance around me, heads bowed like that, some holding candles, any with arms up like that. And they were saying words. I couldn't understand the words, but they were coming at me as this murmuring energy that was very invigorating and refreshing. And in many ways, it re reminded me of the beautiful uh, messages that I'd received in the Gateway Valley and the core realm of how that was my spiritual home and how I truly belong there in a very deep sense that I could feel through and through. And now I was feeling that same thing from this murmuring energy from these beings, but it was way out there in the kind of murky, misty earth where my view that that was happening. And what I called it all was power of prayer. I describe all that in Proof of Heaven, including a vision where I saw my Episcopal uh, rector uh, and good friend and uh, next door neighbor, uh, Michael Sullivan, uh, and his wife both saying prayers to me, even though that never really happened in the physical world. Uh, they both did say prayers, but independently for me. Michael led a lot of them at my bedside, et cetera. Uh, but that vision was very important to me. And then finally, what I saw in this deep coma were six faces that bubbled up out of the muck, uh, it turns out they were very important later because they served as what are called veridical time anchors. They were of people who were physically, five of whom were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours I was in coma. Uh, and that's as opposed to many people, family and friends who had been there earlier in the week who were not apparent to me. And this is what helped me to actually time when my coma events happened relative to earth time. They had to happen between days one and four or one and five of my seven day coma. I explained the timing of all that in Proof of Heaven. Um, and that's a very important fact that kind of helped me to unravel all this. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out that uh, one of those faces was someone who's not physically present. That was uh, Susan Wrenches. She'd been a friend of mine since freshman uh, year in Carolina in 1972, and we were in the same English class. But then I lost touch with her for a long time, and she became a family friend. And my family knew that she had helped people in coma uh, by uh, coach, uh, by basically channeling to them in, in her mental space. And of course, if you'd asked me about channeling for my coma, I would have told you that's all nonsense. It's woo-woo. Yeah. Uh, it's not real. Well, she was there front and center during my coma. So yes, it's absolutely wow. real. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. 
But Susan was right there along with the other uh, faces I saw. Uh, but it turns out it was the sixth face that in many ways was the most important. That was the face of a 10-year-old boy. And I didn't recognize him at the time, but it was my 10-year-old son, Bond. Not a, not a bad name when you think about his role in this whole story. They had protected him from the worst news during most of that week. But um, on day seven of coma, Sunday morning, when he stood outside the door of that family conference where the doctor said it was time to stop the antibiotics and just let me go. He knew that uh, it was much worse than they'd been telling him. He ran down the hallway into ICU bed 10, pulled open my eyelids that had been taped shut. Uh, one eye looking over there, one eye over there, neither pupil working. Those of you in medicine know that's a horrible picture. And he was pleading with me, daddy going to be okay. Daddy going to be okay. As if somehow that would make it so. And I promise you, I did not see him with my eyes. I didn't hear him with my ears. But somehow the message got through across all those levels, deep into the spiritual realm uh, where I was residing. And I remember I had thought up until this time that this entire business could continue or cease. It did not matter. Uh, I didn't sense any connections with any other souls. But now that changed. With his pleading with me, I knew there was another soul out there. And I had a tremendous responsibility to him. But I couldn't understand what what was all this meaning? You know, what was this a plea for my being there for him? Uh, and I knew it was really the most frightening point of the whole journey. Because now it all did matter. And I somehow had to come back. And through all of that process of kind of soul connection, I was able to muster my way back to this world. Uh, and as I said earlier, when I first woke up on that ICU bed and I was struggling against the ventilator tube, my doctors had no idea how to make sense of it because they were quite certain I was never going to wake up from this coma. But they ended up extubating me in the next few minutes, getting that breathing tube out. And I could muster the words, thank you, even though I don't remember saying those words. And I don't remember really anything of the next many hours. Uh, but my youngest sister, who, who was present, told me, I was sitting on the bed like a little Buddha after they took out the breathing tube. And I would look around very meaningfully at everyone surrounding me, looking them in the eyes and say, don't worry, all is well. And I would move to the next person. Nothing to worry about. All is well. And she said it was the most amazing thing for somebody who had just spent a week in deep coma and was expected to die, yeah. who was now up and talking with people. Although it was very frightening because in those next 36 hours, it was clear that my mind was still uh, really quite a mess because of the scrambling of my brain from that meningitis. But the interesting thing is it all cleared up, you know, within the next few days. Uh, as is often the case in, in near-death experiences that are associated with miraculous healing, like Anita Morjani and her healing of uh, stage four lymphoma and deep coma. Or Dr. Mary C. Neal, who had an over 30-minute warm water drowning uh, with her legs broken in a kayak accident, et cetera. And she ended up having a full recovery from that because of her profound spiritual experience in a near-death uh, mode. So uh, these are all beautiful kind of gifts that come to us uh, from acknowledging kind of the richer aspect of who we are, how we're connected with the universe, uh, and how uh, I would say through uh, techniques like sacred acoustics, uh, meditation, that all can come to know this. You don't have to have a near-death experience to come into a deep knowing of your connection with the universe and your ability to manifest wholeness and healing in your own life. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What an unbelievable experience. Um, it must have affected you in so many ways. I've obviously got a few questions about it. I want to ask you, was there any, first of all, I want to ask you, was there any sensation of, would you have any memory of kind of traveling from, you know, when you passed out to wherever the next, you know, the, the, the earthworm view realm that you talked about? Did, did you, was there a tunnel? Was there light? Was there anything like that in the typical sense? Or do you have any memory of it? And the same coming back to your body was, do you have a memory of, how you actually came back yeah, into your body or is that kind of blurry for you? Well, what I would say is that the going out from my body, I really have no memory of. And of course, when mm -hmm. I first came back to this world and in the months after that, trying to make sense of it, it was my neurosurgical knowledge was coming back. An initial assumption was I was just beginning to glean from the doctors that my entire neocortex had been just bombarded with this horrific infection. 
And so to me, to have that loss of memory made some sense because I was still uh, under the illusion of uh, my conventional medical training that memories were stored in the brain. I didn't realize, you know, as, as neurosurgeons have come to surmise in recent decades, there's never been a case uh, in spite of a century plus of resecting a brain from uh, patients for various conditions that we ever took out any defined swathe of long-term memories. So neurosurgeons for a long time have questioned this notion of long-term memories being stored in the brain. But my <clears throat> journey showed me very clearly they are not. Mm. And I think that aligns with a lot of the work in memory that's coming on today. In fact, it aligns with, uh, say, the work of Wilder Penfield, one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of the 20th century, who wrote a book in 1975 called Mystery of the Mind, where he made it very clear that in his work stimulating the brain as a neurosurgeon, he was convinced that you're never going to find free will or consciousness uh, in the brain itself. And he had concluded by that point that memories were not stored in the neocortex or any of the more uh, recently evolved parts of the brain. And by default, he had to assume that maybe they're stored down in the brainstem and some of the most ancient parts of the brain. Although most people in neuroscience would argue that you don't have the complexity there to record the complexity of memory. Uh, and that's where we really kind of face, uh, you know, the fact that memories are not stored in the brain. And when you then go through the scientific literature, for example, on reincarnation, which I knew nothing about before my coma, but if you go to uvadops.org, you can learn a lot more about over six decades of study, scientific study, where just at, at the University of Virginia, they've identified uh, more than 2,700 cases of past life memories in children mm -hmm. suggestive of reincarnation. And 1,700 of those cases are what they call solved. That is, they they found the person described by the child <clears throat> reportedly in a who they uh, lived to be before. Uh, so, I mean, given all that reincarnation data, one would obviously throw away the concept that the brain is essential for retention of memories, because how in the world would you explain uh, those memories being uh, preserved between one lifetime and the next? And do note that only one fifth of those uh, cases of 1700 solved, only one fifth of them involve people who are related to each other. The others are not related through DNA or heredity, what have you. Therefore, that would not be a pathway of remembering anything. Uh, yeah. But anyway, this this whole uh, kind of uh, scientific database has just uh, really exploded over the last many decades. And scientists are just beginning uh, you know, to unravel what it all all means for us, but certainly the afterlife and reincarnation are fully allowed by this kind of empirical data and the theoretical frameworks that are emerging from the science that studies them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm with you on that. It's it's absolutely fascinating stuff they're doing over there and and looking into yeah past life memories and reincarnation. If we say for for a minute then that that memory is stored in our consciousness, right? Let's just say that kind of as a hypothetical which I, I do think that's probably likely and i think that's what you're alluding to as well but let's just say for a second that's what it is why do you think have you kind of i'm, I'm guessing you've questioned yourself about this since the the experience but why do you think if, if that is stored in our consciousness why do you think in your near-death experience you didn't kind of have any memories from your time on earth as eben and you didn't seem to have any sense of sense of self-identification um these kind of things have you yeah have you have you quizzed yourself about that? Have you gone in circles well, about that? Absolutely. And for, first and foremost, I'll point out that a near-death experience is uh, first and foremost and primarily, if not exclusively, designed for the soul going through it. So in other words, uh, mm -hmm. it's there to provide a kind of answers and appropriate framing of questions to help that soul on its journey of, of deeper understanding. Uh, and for me, you know, as, as a neurosurgeon interested in brain-mind connection, the nature of consciousness, um, and these kinds of experiences in general, uh, all I can say is what happened in my NDE was a very beautiful gift that offered mm -hmm. up far more than I ever could have dreamed I would have been able to ask for uh, in this kind of experience in terms of proving to me uh, that memory and consciousness are not created by the brain itself. I mean, that's where I would say the, the case report is so important, that one that came out in the Journal of Nervous Mental Disease, September 2018. 
And in fact, in that case report, the peer review editors challenged the, the three physicians who wrote the case. They said, this case is absurd. You don't have anything like this in the medical literature with someone this sick from gram negative meningoencephalitis ends up making a full recovery. How do you explain it? And the three doctors who wrote the case report said it's because he had a near death experience. That's what allowed for this kind of phenomenal, inexplicable uh, healing. And I think that's really, really kind of the important lesson is they're acknowledging how modern medical science has moved beyond mere placebo effect. Placebo effect is an admission from medical science that a, a patient's belief, thoughts, and attitudes can play a yeah. tremendous role in healing and in wellness. Well, you move beyond placebo effect, which has become the gold standard for assessing any new treatment modality. You move into the territory of spontaneous remissions. Say, go to noetic.org, the Institute of Noetic Sciences website, put in spontaneous remission, you'll find a, a book they published back in the mid 1990s, and they're now redoing the database, reassessing, building anew the database, which will be very exciting. Helena Wabe is working on that project now. But even the, the mid 1990s version had 3,500 cases of people who had healed themselves beyond any medical intervention of advanced cancers, infections, et cetera. And uh, it's just, and then when you lead from that into the, the uh, spontaneous or into the miraculous healing and near-death experiences like not mine, Anita Morjani, Mary C. Niels, and others. Uh, you just find that uh, all of this is showing us a tremendous amount of mind over matter and the power of kind of acknowledging our, our role as spiritual beings in a spiritual universe can play a tremendous uh, uh, hand in uh, offering us benefits of health, healing, and wholeness. That's what I think is really kind of the main lesson we're to learn from all this. Uh, and to me, uh, my journey of, I mean, it's it's actually uh, some of my biggest support comes from the scientific community because they're the ones who can actually read those those medical, uh, medical case report and realize how astonishing my situation is. I mean, it's what yeah. haunted me when I first came out of coma in those first few months as my knowledge was coming back to me. But my memories of the deep coma experience defied any kind of thinking I'd had about the brain, mind, and consciousness from a materialist perspective and demanded a much broader uh, explanation that invoked primacy of consciousness, eternity of soul, you know, major concepts like that. And that's where I think, um, you know, my journey when I look back on it makes perfect sense that that's the one that unfolded for me it's also apparent why my father my adoptive father if I'd scripted this he would have been there front and center he passed over four years before my coma but as I learned when he did appear to me in meditation two and a half years after my coma and this is all explained in the book living in a mindful universe it became clear to me that if he had been my my spiritual guide or my guardian angel uh, in spite of my one in, you know, a 10 million diagnosis of gram negative uh, E. coli meningitis in an adult, in spite of my one in a billion recovery, if my adoptive father had been there as the spiritual guide, I would have been a little more tempted to just toss it out as, well, I guess you see who you want to see on the way out. So it's just a wishful thinking vision. But it couldn't have been that uh, that's why I think the book Proof of Heaven such a, had such a tremendous impact on this world and certainly on uh, the reading community and on, on the scientific community was because the identity of that beautiful guardian angel turned out to be someone I never knew in this life. And yet she was very important to me in this life. Um, and that, that whole story, I won't share it all now because it's such a beautiful part of the ending of the book, Proof of Heaven, but it has to do with the fact that I was adopted and that much of my life, uh, having been put up for adoption when I was 11 days old, but my birth mother, who was 16 years old, unwed, was unable to, she didn't want to give me away. So she wouldn't sign the papers. And that left me in limbo in this baby dorm for about four months until she finally signed me away to be adoptable. Uh, and that really kind of gave me a, a background in my life of whether or not I was worthy of love, to have that long period in a baby dorm without any defined uh, parenting going on. Uh, sent me into kind of a, a subconscious dark night of the soul uh, that I wrestled with through much of my life. And people who've read book, book Proof of Heaven will realize that I was wrestling with that right up until the time of my coma. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that I had a perceived rejection from my birth mother in the year 2000. 
And that took me into a dark night of the soul where I doubted any belief I'd ever had in a loving personal God or power of prayer. I stopped taking my sons to church, saying prayers with them at night. And that's the way it was up until my coma. And also of note, a year before my coma, I finally did reach out again uh, and did successfully meet my birth family. Uh, so all that, again, is backstory to what is told in Proof of Heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, important to point out that the journey that is going to be most informative to the soul that's having it is the journey that unfolds in a near-death experience. Yeah, no, definitely. That makes sense. And seeing as you mentioned your birth mother, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard you mention somewhere else that when you, or the day you went into your coma, she was maybe coming back from a holiday or something somewhere, and she had a, sen a strong sense that something was very wrong, something wasn't good with you and she contacted your family is that right and then found absolutely. out absolutely yeah it turns out we we had met back in october of 2007 i had written a letter ended up meeting them uh my birth parents um uh, october 5th 2007 uh that story is beautiful uh, again that's all told in proof of heaven big hugs uh the next uh, weekend meeting of a uh, brother and sister who was still uh here in the physical plane uh, and then meeting aunts and uncles, getting to know them all over the next uh, six months or so. Then we spent a time of several months where we really weren't communicating very much. I mean, it was a beautiful, loving reunion. Um, we connected, no question about it. Uh, and that was really the setting where all this happened. Because when I went into coma, November 10th, 2008, uh, my, my birth mother had been on a business trip uh, with my birth father. And when they came back, she was very pained that night. I've got to reach out. I've got to call them. Something's going on. She knew something was wrong. Uh, and of course, she called, got my former spouse and found out I'd got, gone into the hospital that morning, deep in coma with seizures and was now on a ventilator and uh, uh, with a high likelihood that I would succumb to this illness. So yes, she was very warranted in feeling this connection with me and uh, uh you know, acting on that hunch. And of course, I've heard uh, many hundreds of stories like that myself. So uh, yeah. the reality of telepathy between people who are connected at a soul level is no surprise at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just a part of, of my unfolding story was that deep sense of connection that she felt at the time uh, with me and that turned out to be right on the money. Yeah, it's amazing. It's another thing that science is going to struggle to prove empirically or anything like that. And you can't make that repeatable and, and everything. But what what a compelling, you know, occasion, what a compelling experience. And like you said, hundreds of people have had the same kind of experiences. Um, let me ask you one other thing about your actual NDE. Um, it might seem a kind of silly question, um, but I just wonder whether you recall any sense of smell or anything from from in any of the different realms. Well, I actually do. Um, and in fact, I described that in proof of heaven, how it was kind of a biological smell, but, you know, uh, bloody, uh, but uh, kind of deeper, richer, more primordial than that. So, uh, in fact, I, I also muse in the book Proof of Heaven about uh, something called synesthesia. I really should not use that word. Uh, because it means something different in normal psychology. It's basically pe some people can smell colors. Um, yeah. or they can see sounds. In other words, you have an overlap of sensory modalities. And mm -hmm. I would say in an NDE, you can easily experience that in a very powerful way. But part of that is acknowledging that what you're doing by getting to the very root of conscious awareness, you're getting to the very source of our awareness. And that is a realm where all of it originates in, in kind of a bound fashion. Uh, and then we, we tend to kind of split it out and separate it out in our scientific musings over the working of the nervous system and all of that. But ultimately, what it's pointing out is that this, this idea of the one mind, that it's all ultimately connected uh, at the deepest uh, source levels, I think is an important thing to point out here. Uh, and that's also where the concept of dissociation is very important. You know, in, in modern psychiatry, psychology, uh, the word dissociation is often used, for example, to describe people with multiple personalities because they seem to have within their own mind a splitting out or a dissociation 
uh, of what turns into multiple personalities. The interesting thing is, for example, if you do scientific study in that kind of a case, you'll find, uh, for example, there's a report of someone who has a blind alter. That is, one of their personalities cannot see. Uh, and if you do a functional MRI of them, when they're in that alter, the occipital cortex does not light up like it would in somebody who can see. But if they're in the other altar, the other dissociated altar that has vision, functional MRI shows them to then reacquire a uh, visual function in their occipital cortex. So it's interesting how this dissociation can yeah. lead to such a prominent uh, kind of division of a of, of parent brain associated with mental faculties. Uh, you know, it's, it's just showing us how little we know about brain and mind and and how our assumptions are often lead us astray. But that dissociation is a much broader concept when applied to primordial mind. Uh, for example, as we discuss in Living in a Mindful Universe, the whole notion of objective idealism, that there's really one mind, kind of a God mind that's running it all, but that we have this apparent dissociation into our individual minds. But an NDE is a perfect example of how those individual minds are a fiction. Because mm -hmm. the first thing that happens in many people's NDEs is they reunite with souls of people, of loved ones who have left the physical world, but at the same time, they can experience the minds of those who are still on the physical world. For example, Anita Morjani, in her NDE story, she talks about uh, witnessing her brother who is flying from India to Hong Kong, supposedly for her funeral, uh, and she melds with his mind while he's on the airplane making that flight. Also, she melds with the mind of her father who had already passed from the physical world. So in other words, we're liberated from uh, the shackles of our uh, physical brain and body. And this notion that our mind is completely contained, you know, between our ears, uh, we end up coming into a notion where our mind is much grander than that. And that's the same mind that can go through a full and life review and can experience that from the mental, emotional perspective of other minds. So this is all indicating to us that essentially we're talking about one mind and the ways that it actually dissociates into apparent individuals, but that in fact, uh, life reviews, NDEs, et cetera, show us that that is only a kind of a partial interpretation of what's really going on and that ultimately uh that mental space is where we're all interconnected yeah wow there's so much uh, so much we could talk about in there that but let me ask you before we we're going to probably circle back to quite a bit of that but um we talked about your religion and your kind of um outlook before your nd so after your nd then what was your feeling obviously you felt this about the one mind and things like that but do you have any sense of religion and i ask you that partly because obviously as a few of your books have the word heaven in the title um I've, I've heard you mention a few times prayer and things like that and i think you maybe you did hint that you do go to church or you used to take your son to church when he was younger something along those lines and i just wonder how it all fits for you i do you consider yourself religious do you consider yourself spiritual and how do you align all of these different things well, one thing you'll find out when you read the big literature on NDEs, go to Ruth Grayson's work, Jan Holden, the people who have looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of cases and study them scientifically, is that more than 90% of near-death experiencers come back believing in God, in some God form. Now, I'm not saying it's by Christian or Islam or what have you definition, but they come back believing in a God of love, of compassion, of kindness, of mercy, acceptance, yeah. uh, that allows forgiveness. Every bit of that is focused on by people who return from NDEs. So that's kind of the background, uh, is if all these people who have been there come back believing that there's a force of, of loving unification at the core of the universe, that it's absolutely real, Maybe some the rest of us should take that seriously. Uh, so that's 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 part of the discussion. Now, another thing I would say, though, I mentioned Robert Kopp's book earlier, The Essence of Religions. And I think that's a very important book from my uh, viewpoint. He basically says that the gold standard of what religion should be doing is teaching the, the ultimate lessons of near-death experiences, love, kindness, compassion, you know, the golden rule written into the fabric of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more that any religion comes close to doing that, the better. Uh, but they have the free will to do otherwise. And some religions have gotten way away from the message of the prophets. They've gotten very exclusive. 
Um, and from my point of view, they've just become worthless and, and useless by uh, divesting themselves so far from the, from the deep and simple truth of NDEs that we're really all in this together and we yeah. really should be here to take care of each other. And I would say that ultimately that's where the science of consciousness will go with all of this. Uh, you know, religions have had 5,000 years plus to try and teach us these, this lesson of the golden rule and taking care of each other. They've done it to various uh, degrees of success or not. Uh, but this is really a scientific revolution about the nature of consciousness, the one mind. I would say the philosophical position that is emerging, you know, in, we, in our book, Living the Mind for Universe, we talk, talk about objective idealism. But I think if you're paying attention to what we're saying, especially with our notions of God and that infinitely loving force that we all find at the core of conscious awareness, you know, in, the, in near death and, and related experiences, uh, we're really talking about something that would better be called evolutionary panentheism. And that, I think, uh, simply means that free will is very real as opposed to materialist science. They would try and tell you it's all chemical reactions, electron fluxes in the brain. So the illusion of free will is a complete myth, according to conventional science. They have it completely backwards. The thing that actually exists is that consciousness, that mind, that free will, uh, and that loving uh, binding force is kind of the ambience of something that we all share together. Uh, and I would say that uh, this science uh, really is irrefutable uh, moving forward because all the evidence supports it. And now a beautiful example of that and a good resource for your, your listeners uh, is a contest that was held in the year 2021 um, globally. It was run by Robert Bigelow. Yeah. Uh, he's an aerospace engineer. His wife had, had, had passed from this world. His son had committed suicide. So we had very valid reasons to ask, you know, where are they? Are they still here in some sense? And so he put to the scientific community, what's the best scientific evidence for the survival of conscious awareness beyond permanent bodily death? That was the question put out in the spring of, of 2021. They received more than a thousand replies of people who wanted to participate and said that you have to show at least five years experience, a, a rigorous scientific experience investigating the afterlife question. Uh, in that setting, they received 204 essays. Uh, essays were limited to 25,000 words apiece, and they were originally going to give out three monetary prizes. Well, in fact, the quality of the essays was so good, they gave out 29 monetary prizes. All 29 winning essays are available to the reading public for free right now. Yeah. Go to BigelowInstitute.org, and you will uncover the these 29 essays. You can start off with uh, Jeffrey Mishlov's first place essay. And yeah. you'll quickly start to realize that the evidence for the afterlife is beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, and in fact, the scientific question uh, is something that's very well addressed in several of those papers. Pim Van Lommel, who won second place. Uh, Bernardo Kastrup wrote an excellent, uh, a completely modern scientific uh, assessment here that doesn't rely on any kind of parapsychological findings whatsoever. But all the papers take a different uh, angles on this question, and they uh, they very successfully come through showing you uh, how to consider that the afterlife is not scientifically valid in the current era. It just means that you haven't uh, you're not familiar with the evidence. Uh, when yeah. you become familiar with the evidence, you'll have no doubt uh, that there's a lot there supporting the reality of the afterlife and reincarnation, and that the scientific community just needs to uh, grow up and start coming up with better theoretical models. In fact, there are scientists working on this. If you go to GalileoCommission.org, scientificandmedical.net, uh, the work of David Lorimer, uh, the work of uh, many others around this world, uh, are all pointing in the same direction of, of a science that is fully uh, conversant in trying to understand and explain these phenomena uh, on a much larger scale. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think the only way that you can maybe explain all of this evidence for, for survival, uh, explain it away as something else, is the the super psi um, explanation. And, and for me, for most people, that doesn't, even enter the realms of reality you know so it's whichever way you went with it 
it would defy modern science. So you see what I'm saying? Is even yeah. if even if it was super size, we're in the same boat as in nobody accepts that. Um, but that's well, pretty much all we're left with. I would simply add, I mean, you're right to point out that in scientific circles, that super sci argument is the, the last remnant of anything that doesn't reflect true survival of the soul. But I would say there are too many cases of examples of, of people gleaning knowledge uh, from these uh, discarnate spirits that no living soul has access to. And those, in my mind, are very solid uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, how super sci will not ultimately answer the question. And then I there are so, so many other kind of uh, kind of uh, perspectives, like after death communications, deathbed mm -hmm. visions, all that happens in the hospice community. For example, the work of uh, Christopher Kerr, K E R R, in his beautiful book "Death Is But a Dream." Uh, he talks about it purely from the hospice and palliative care community, and you find out it overlaps overlaps perfectly the experience of near-death experiencers and their life reviews. And uh, I mean, every bit of this points to the power of our loving soul connections. Uh, and, and the very fact that loved ones appear, that's the most authentic sign uh, that someone is approaching death. It happened in my own mother in April of uh, 2019. She was age 99. And the last four uh, days and nights of her life, she was basically unresponsive because of a, a respiratory illness and fever and all that kind of thing. So she was gone from this world. Uh, and yet two nights before she died at 2.30 in the morning, according to the nurse taking care of her, she woke up, got out of bed, which would, was pretty much impossible, uh, and, and came to the nurse and said, my mother's here, my mother's here, call my children right away, she's really here. When I heard that, I knew she was very, very close. And we, at the time, we were actually traveling and, and talk about synchronicity. We were giving a presentation at that time at the Shivananda um, yoga retreat in Paradise Island, Bahamas, with William Peters, who had uh, just published his book, uh, uh, I think it's called At Death's Door, uh, but where he talks all about shared crossings. And uh, that's what we were doing when my mother is having this incredible uh, coming back to life when, you know, she'd been uh, unresponsive for days now because of this respiratory thing, of yeah. pleading with the nurse to call the children, which the nurse did not do, I'm sad to say. <laughs> but when I heard the story, uh, you know, I knew she was very close and we did make it home in time for her to pass. All yeah. my sisters and I were there. Uh, and had this beautiful experience of, of witnessing many people that I didn't even know in dreams that night, lying on the floor beside her bed, her last night on earth. Uh, but it's just, uh, once you realize that those are the authenticators, yeah. uh, you know, the when the loved ones are returning, that's what uh, Gregory Shushan, for example, who's written about near-death experiences and cultures going back thousands of years, primitive mm -hmm. cultures, what have you, he finds the most common ingredient is souls of departed loved ones appearing to welcome us over, to comfort us in the transition. And of yeah. course, me before coma would have said that's all wishful thinking, imagination. Me post coma realizes that's a true uh, imprimatur that shows the reality of journey unfolding when our loved ones are there to greet us and welcome us over yeah absolutely it's remarkable and thanks for sharing that story that you know the the kind of waking up in the middle of the night and and being like oh my mother's here and what have you that's a classic example of terminal lucidity isn't it and it's just it is yeah it's just unbelievable it's so fascinating and, and gregory i just spoke to him recently for this show and we had a really long conversation about yeah all of his research into yeah ndes oh, and excellent. the afterlife through through the ages and and yeah he's he's done some really fascinating and really valuable work um which is going to hopefully yeah, help push this all forward um so again just on that on your books so heaven can you kind of put into words when you use the word heaven like that you're not thinking of the typical christian heaven exactly is that kind of just another word that you're using in this context for the afterlife um or is there a bit more to it well there there's a lot more to it in fact uh, that title when i first went to the publisher my title was in of one 
that's a title I liked. It had to do with like a medical study where you really have one case, but that case has a lot of importance to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually at a meeting with ABC where several people chimed in at once uh, in, in arguing why ABC should promote this book launch. They said, it's because it's proof of heaven. And that's really where the title came from. And when I first heard it, I said, that's a terrible title. Proof is only used in mathematics. You never talk about a proof in science. Uh, you know, science is all about hypothesis and working your way towards refined hypothesis and deeper understanding, but you never have a proof. And heaven was such a buzzword. I didn't want to use that at all. But, uh, you know, the publisher ended up winning out. Uh, I, I still regretted it uh, as the book came out because I realized a lot of people that it was aimed for, that would be a lot of skeptical, scientific-minded people, weren't going to pick it up because it had the word heaven in the title. Um, and it's, you know, the reality is what this book is all about, what, what my stories, my experience are all about, are the continuity of consciousness, that it's not created by the brain, that we have a spiritual existence that becomes very real, especially when we leave the physical body at the time of death, and that our souls do not get it all done in one incarnation. That's why we have to come back again and again. So it's certainly about very relevant uh, aspects of religion, and yet what you'll find is those same uh, uh, scientists who study uh, near-death experiences will tell you that people who have these experiences come back less religious, but more spiritual. Yeah. Very simple. They come back realizing we're spiritual beings in a spiritual universe that has everything to do with the science of one mind, uh, of the brain as a filter of understanding how all that works. Uh, it also acknowledges completely these tremendous uh, number of human stories of life between lives and then of past life memories. Uh, and so, yes, let's take these instead of the olden days of materialist science saying that's all impossible. Our weak and puny little theories can't understand it. So it can't be true mm -hmm. and say, well, look, look, we've got evidence. Why don't we follow the evidence? And then we'll try and uh, be smart and, and come up with the theories that support it. And especially yeah. when you look at quantum physics in the modern mm -hmm. world, it's something that's been screaming at us for almost a century, that consciousness is not generated by the brain, but is something far more primordial in the universe. That's why um, Wolfgang Pauli and, and uh, uh, Max Planck, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Pasquale Jordan, uh, Eugene Wigner. I mean, all of these scientists who were deeply into quantum physics were saying things about how, uh, you know, consciousness is fundamental in the universe. It's primary. Werner Heisenberg, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle said the first sip or the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will lead you towards atheism. But at the bottom of the glass, God's waiting for you. That was his way of saying that Newtonian determinism, the science that was prevalent at the time when quantum physics uh, emerged, that science would try and pretend there is no God, but that the free will that's returned to the table with modern quantum physics is screaming at us that we're spiritual beings in a spiritual universe. The brain is a filter. The more we can understand how this works, the more we can more deeply understand the nature of reality, and especially of our free will abilities as sentient beings to influence that emerging reality. Absolutely. Let's talk about something slightly different for a minute. And I want to ask you about your work, your research into extraordinary cases of miraculous healings, because you mentioned a couple of things along those lines today. And I understand that you've done some, yeah, quite a bit of looking into that. So Tell me a little bit about your work in that area. Well, basically, it involves uh, working with other indie ears. My mm -hmm. second book, The Map of Heaven, was really my attempt to show people that these experiences are very, very common. I mean, for example, we moved into a little rural neighborhood here in Virginia. When we first moved in here, we were sharing some of these stories at a dinner party uh, with a bunch of people kind of our age and older, you know, pretty uh, conservative lot by and large. Uh, and we're hearing all kinds of stories of people with electronic communications, fun co phone calls from departed loved ones, et cetera, text messages, all this kind of stuff happening. And these people were wide open to the possibilities, but they didn't really share it. They hadn't shared them with anything because uh, they th thought people would think they're crazy. People tend to hide these things in our society. And yet when you share these stories much more broadly, and of course we did more of that 
in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, that's where people really start to realize how important it is to acknowledge all of this in our modern society. Uh, just uh, to add to that, your, your prior question, I was just going to say that um, it does involve uh, more detailed work with other near-death experiencers. Uh, uh, for example, Anita Morjani, Mary C. Neal, um, mm. uh, Jeff Olson, and others of uh, to really kind of line up some of the the medical details make better sense of that uh and again those cases that uh, that i often discuss mary c neal and her over 30 minute warm water drowning yeah uh anita morjani and her advanced stage 4b uh lymphoma being deep in coma those are uh, kind of common examples that i discuss but there are others that uh that i like reviewing with other near-death experiencers to help kind of fill in the gaps on that kind of data absolutely do you do you know Mary C. Neal well? Um, do you know her personally? I mean, like, um, have you met her? Yes, I I've presented with Mary C. Neal uh, several mm -hmm. times. Uh, I find yeah. her to be an absolute delight. Uh, she had a beautiful experience uh, that, yeah. in her case, involved a very direct connection with Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, I think she tells a beautiful story, and it's clear that she had a tremendous amount of healing from her spiritual journey uh, that mm -hmm. that all of us could learn from. Yeah, it's an incredible ND. And I guess, yeah, you're right that that's an example of Mary, I think, is religious and she sees it as Jesus, right? Is that, or does she, she still sees it as, yeah, Jesus Christ after the, right. after the experience? What I would point out about, about that whole issue is I would say that uh, how we, uh, what we experience in an NDE is due to the NDE itself and is not mm. going to be due to our prior religious beliefs. How mm. we tell the story can be influenced by our prior beliefs uh and for her it was a very real encounter with uh, christ and uh, i've known others who've had a beautiful uh, experience like that uh that was not the experience i had my experience uh, uh i think because of my amnesia uh, had to be a little bit different yeah. uh you know in terms of what i would recognize through that uh, that dense kind of cloud of amnesia for any mm -hmm. religious concepts or scientific knowledge or kind of any of my personal experience in life uh in many ways was kind of shielded from me uh during the nde and i think in retrospect that was very important uh in t teaching me some of the deepest lessons of the near-death experience yeah and like you said earlier most people if, if we can say most, but yeah, I think it's most people would go into an NDE and they come out spiritual rather than religious. Um, some, right. some might go in religious and come out with that strengthened, but I think, yeah, most come out and it's more of a, an overarching thing because we see that these happen across all religions and, and with people that are not religious as well. And there's, right. there's a lot. And there are some great common. stories out there about atheists having profound mm. near death experiences yeah. where they come away realizing there's a lot more going on in this universe than they thought before. Many yeah. of them come away realizing, you know, God is is an answer to that question. Although some yeah. of them do not, they just think there are forces of mind far beyond uh, uh, anything that uh, we experience in this material realm, and that yet they're not re ready to label them in any way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. There's so many different ways of looking at it, but it's fascinating the the universal similarities. Um, since your NDE, have you noticed that, have you experienced any kind of anomalous things? Have you had any kind of psi phenomena, for example? Have you, have you noticed that you've had any precognitive dreams or any, you know, communications with people, nonverbal, non, not using our normal senses, anything along these lines? Well, I'd say, yeah, especially in the first six to 12 months after the coma experience, I had a lot of the microelectronic effects. Uh, for one thing, I was a, a, aware of uh, what I would consider to be a much kind of stronger, more in tune and resonant intuition with others and empathy that went far beyond. I think that's kind of what my son was sensing, Evan the fourth, when he said I was like there was a light shining within me. I was far more present than I'd ever been before. I think that's what he was was picking up on. Yeah. Uh, but the microelectronics were. The most obvious for uh, six to 12 months, uh, things like my watch not working. I had to go through three watches before I found one that would work. And interestingly enough, even though the stem was broken on that watch, it ended up keeping perfect time of, uh, you know, over months at a time, it wouldn't deviate. I don't know how that worked. Uh, but also like walking down a street, street lights would go out. I just thought it was infrastructure problems. I, I didn't read until later that, you know, NDEers often have that kind of thing. 
but then after about a year or so, I would say those kind of events softened up a lot. Interesting. Um, things like computers crashing much more than they had before, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but really the connection with others. Uh, and, and for me, part of the problem uh, in terms of uh, defining how much of this is due to my NDE is that I also started meditating an hour to a day. I started mm -hmm. that back in, uh, in basically 2011. Uh, so I've been doing that for 11 or 12 years now, a, a tremendous amount of meditation. Uh, wow. For me, I use sacred acoustics. People who want to learn more about that powerful tool of binaural beat brainwave entrainment can go to sacredacoustics.com uh, to learn more. But I'd, I had heard that putting uh, slightly different frequency tones into the two ears could lead to uh, profound alterations in consciousness something that had been discovered by Robert Monroe, looking at out-of-body experiences in the 70s and 80s. Uh, other investigators looking at remote viewing, which is one of the most scientifically validated forms of non-local consciousness for information uh, yeah. discernment. Um, and remote viewing has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt, according to the Jessica Utz, the head of the American Statistical association back in 2015 in her yeah. presidential address but excuse me but uh these are all uh kind of aspects of non-local consciousness that i think more fully support uh, the reality of uh, uh you know a soul independent of, of brain and mind um and that we're much grander than just these physical beings leading a birth to death existence and that's where I think we can do a lot of growth and kind of acknowledging our relationship with the universe and our kind of sense of information acquisition and what we can do to influence our emerging reality. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So did it change you in any other ways, the ND? Because obviously it's changed your life in, in lots of ways and in the typical sense of what you said with the, the electronics and things like that, obviously spiritual wise your spirituality wise you look at the world in a whole different way now your worldview has changed what else was there anything else that you look back and say and it, empathy i guess is another one that you've just referred to but yeah certainly em it empathy and intuition um and i use that a lot for healing i mean when i know of people who have certain illness uh, uh i'm often in these hour to a day of of uh uh of uh, using sacred acoustics to get into a deep dive into consciousness. I'm often using that energy to help bring healing to others. So um, that's really uh, kind of my, my biggest focus, although working with scientists around the world to better define the mind-brain relationship and kind of the nature of consciousness and uh, how we can uh, better influence our emerging uh, health and wholeness, that is something I'm focused on on a regular basis in my mm -hmm. Life partner, uh, Karen Newell, who's also the co author of Living in Mindful Universe. She's the co founder of Sacred Acoustics with her business partner, Kevin Cossey, who's the sound engineer. Uh, but I work a lot with them on developing uh, those tones. Karen and I do workshops around the world, helping uh, people realize that you don't have to have a near death experience to come into this kind of knowledge, that just by being a sentient being, by being conscious. Uh, and by exploring your consciousness and becoming much more aware of kind of that meta consciousness, uh, that all of us can come into kind of a deeper understanding of our relationship with the universe and of our abilities to influence that emerging kind of idealized uh, reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so these workshop meditations, working with sacred acoustics to develop uh, new meditations. I know that uh, for one thing, uh, help to foster a, a one of the peer reviewed scientific publications supporting sacred acoustics. That was by Dr. Anna Usum. Came out in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in February of 2020. Uh, and that was in a busy psychiatric practice in New York where she found that over two weeks, she had a 26% reduction in anxiety symptoms in her patient population compared to only a 7% reduction. Uh, in those who received standard talk therapy over those two weeks. Uh, so that pilot study is a very uh, strong uh, proponent of the use of differential frequency brainwave entrainment in the form of sacred acoustics tones to help people alleviate anxiety. And, and what I'd like to do is actually use these tones um, in uh, addictions and fear of death uh, in other places where, for example, 
psilocybin has been shown to be of great use in alleviating of, of, of debilitating fear of death in cancer patients and severe addictions like alcoholism, uh, nicotine, opiates, et cetera. A single dose or, or two doses of psilocybin in a proper therapeutic setting can often completely alleviate those kinds of illnesses, addictions, or fear of death for years on end. Uh, and I believe that you could accomplish the same thing through our meditative techniques. And that's what I'm uh, in the process of trying to uh, uh, study. Yeah. Wow. And so you, you need the headphones and you just have a, two different kind of tones coming through. And at the same time, you have to get yourself into a meditative state. Is it as simple as that? And are these tones, well, are they free really to access simple. online? I would say it, it's basically acknowledging uh, the first thing to get is that that voice in your head is not your consciousness. So mm -hmm. many of us think that voice in our head is who we are. I love how Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, he calls that voice in your head, your annoying roommate. That's it. That's all you need to know. And so the goal of these differential frequency tones is to let that annoying roommate, your ego mind, make a request, ask a question, state an intention, what have you, but then it goes into timeout because I've learned uh, the great effect of stating that intention, but then just riding the tones and by listening to the tones and just letting my psyche kind of go up and down with these wavering tones, uh, before I know it, I'm not even hearing them anymore. I'm off on a deep journey uh, into my consciousness beyond the bounds of the here now and the apparent sense of self that the linguistic brain and the ego mind uh, are presenting to us constantly. And it's by rising above that little ego mind and leaving it in the rear view mirror and exploring conscious and awareness across the veiling function of the brain that we really start to uh, gain benefit from this kind of thing. And that's where I found meditation to be so important. It, is in, it enables me to quiet that little uh, monkey mind voice in my head of Evan Alexander's little blah, 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 and come into a much greater uh, richness uh, of awareness uh, through exploring consciousness across the veil. And that's what writing the tones has enabled me to do over these uh, 11 plus years of experiencing it. Wow, that's amazing. And you've had quite a, quite a number of profound experiences via meditation, I suppose. I mean, you mentioned earlier that you communicated with your father um, while you were meditating. And I suppose you've had plenty of other profound yeah, experiences Do you, would you mind sharing one of those or, or that one if you if you don't mind well yeah i think it's important to point out that i state that intention and make that request and then i go on the ride uh you know with these deep tones um and i don't always you know it's not like every time i meditate i get right to my father or my mm. uh, birth sister or whatever spiritual guy that it's very um I would say it's easy for me to get in touch with that infinitely loving God force. I found that during my coma to be the very source of conscious awareness. So that's a part of us that is, is very easy to get to uh, in deep meditation. Uh, but I, I find I have to be persistent over days and weeks to actually get answers to some of these bigger questions from my spirit guides, because I really have to wait for them in many ways uh, to be ready to offer it up to me. It doesn't just come at my kind of beck and, and, and will and whim, uh, but I really, I need input from their side. But that's where patience and keeping a journal, I think are very important. Uh, kind of keeping a record of what happens. I, I, I've often said that the answer can come before the question, but we don't necessarily uh, recognize it as such. So that's why it's so important to kind of journal what you're going through. And, um, and, and also I use whatever mystery seems to crop up in one meditation, pursuing one question to be the seed of a question for the next meditation. Mm -hmm. And by that way, I'm kind of following a, a train of breadcrumbs that the meditations are leaving for me that ultimately lead towards a kind of a richer pattern recognition and understanding. Um, yeah. But it comes in, in many different ways, in many different forms. Uh, but what I found is that uh, the value of, of a continued practice of meditation has really helped me to glean those uh, uh, those benefits on a much more uh, kind of routine fashion. Uh, and again, it's not not as if the answers come to you in some simple narrative. 
they'll often come in symbolic fashion. Uh, often it can be quite deep and you have to pursue the symbolism through uh, progressive meditations uh, to finally start getting at things that fit together as an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I found is with a diligent pursuit uh, and kind of keeping track of those breadcrumbs through journaling uh, and through using that as seeds for next meditations, uh, I've ended up getting a lot of answers to those questions, a deeper understanding of the mind-brain relationship, of the role of quantum physics, what it is actually showing us about the nature of reality, how important is that whole phenomenon of entanglement, uh, which was honored by the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, it basically, from my perspective, is showing us very clearly the mental universe, that connected form of the universe, that we used to think just came with our understanding of it from a human perspective is something that is emerging all the time in this kind of a grander pursuit of understanding of the nature of truth and reality uh, and realizing that that entanglement is just another form of the mental universe where we're all kind of interconnected through inf information. Mm. From what you were saying there, I felt a lot of parallels between dreams as well. Have you had many profound dreams and have you ever been able to communicate with, with somebody on the other side via your dreams or, or anything like that, whether spontaneous or planned? Um, yeah. Well, I do. I, I must say that my, my dream space seemed to uh, shift in a way with my focus on meditation. And uh, I think in, in, in the last few years, uh, my meditation in many ways seemed to kind of take over from the dream space. But in recent months, I think the dream space is reclaiming some territory there with some very vivid dreams that I think are connected with my meditative efforts. Mm. So I, I look at them as kind of a common space. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of overlap with uh, the mental space, kind of the mental universe and that information space that you would e either call like the Akashic record or the quantum hologram. That's a term that Edgar Mitchell and Bob Steritz used in a particular paper on consciousness that I find very appealing, uh, the quantum hologram. To me, it's it's the field of the mental universe, but with all possibilities for a sentient being to manifest. And that's kind of the space that I find that I'm exploring in deep meditation uh, and trying to put to good use in terms of manifesting kind of the world of my dreams is that the notion of the quantum hologram. Yeah. Um, but I think there are scientific models that are emerging now, like uh, uh, Bernard Carr in, in England has done a lot of work on hyperdimensional models that I think would be very important because they involve higher dimensions, not only of space, but also of time, like that uh, notion of deep time or meta time that I explained early on in my experience as a best way of looking at life reviews and how they unfold, you know, with your entire life being visible to you. Uh, the way they can do that is that they're in a completely higher order temporal dimension uh, of meta time. Um, and so I think Bernard Carr is, is one physicist. Uh, he worked with uh, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, in his doctoral work. So Bernard Carr is a very brilliant uh, physics uh, mind. And I think uh, his work in, uh, in higher dimensional space and time is very important in this kind of scientific discussion. Mm. I don't want to take up too much of your time Eben, right? So before we finish, maybe to kind of run through a few of the questions that I had uh, left unanswered, maybe we're going to try and do a little kind of semi quick fire uh, style okay. to, to finish things off here, if you're okay. So maybe I'll kind of say either a question or, or give you a topic, and maybe you can just kind of share your thoughts in a nutshell. Okay. Um, just good. in, yeah, a minute or two, and, and hopefully I'll get you out of here fairly soon. Um, okay. I was going to ask you about children with past life memories, reincarnation. You've already kind of referenced it a few times. And I think you, you've said enough for, for anybody listening to understand where you stand on it. Um, and that's that you think it's a very real phenomenon um, that fits into the, the greater jigsaw that is all of this, that is reality. Um, so right. what about mediumship? What are your thoughts on on mediumship, both kind of mental and physical? Um, obviously, there, there well, are some Well, first of all, I'll point out that I do believe that there are a lot of uh, psychic mediums out there that are not very good, don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and uh, and you know, or frauds that's, as that's well. the reality too. of human existence. Mm. But that does not deny the fact that there are also uh, at least 20 mediums I know of that have been confirmed by uh, Julie Beichel. She's done mm. some extremely good scientific work. She wrote one of the very good Bigelow Institute papers. 
Um, and she has a website, winbridge.org. I would highly recommend people go there. We discussed her work in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. It's highly reputable work. She has a great reputation among other scientists. She has a quintuply blinded protocol for assessing uh, mediums. And an important thing that I'll point out is one of the things that makes it all work, given that the medium is only given a first name uh, yeah. of the discarnate soul, like Ralph, and that's all the information they have. Well, you might ask, how in the world can that kind of a system ever work? Well, the reason I think it works is that part of the uh, system they have is that the sitter, that's the person who has lost a loved one who they want to connect with, the sitter uh, asks in prayer meditation and asks that uh, a departed soul to help the psychic connect the dots uh, so that they give useful information. And it's by invoking help from the other side in that fashion that I believe everything ends up working. And that's why I, for instance, uh, in my meditation, I will uh, use that intent or prayer to ask my loved ones on the other side to help connect all the dots. But the windbridge.org uh, data is very supportive of, of the reality of some psychic mediums to actually be you know, psychic mediums. And I know my own personal experience is with Laura Lynn Jackson, who wrote the book, The Light Between Us. And I, I was highly impressed with her abilities. Well, she is one of Julie Weichel's uh, 20 plus accredited mediums. Yeah. So have you, you've sat with Laura, Laura Lynn Jackson? I have um, wow. more than once. And, would, you, uh, would you feel comfortable to share any of those experiences that you had with her or are they too personal? Well, you know, we covered some of that in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. But for instance, I'll tell you one thing that really got my attention was when she was first focusing on me on our very first reading, she recognized that there was something wrong with the naming, uh, with the numbering. You know, I was Evan Alexander III. My father was Evan Alexander Jr. But she sensed that there were some errors in all that. And in fact, she surmised that... Uh, uh, that I was two orders away from that, uh, the third, and that I was actually the fifth. And she picked up on that in ways that were very shocking to me. Uh, and I, I didn't hint to her at the time that she was on target, but mm. I was uh, very amazed that she had picked up on that in spite of the fact that that particular fact about my name is not mentioned anywhere on the internet, by anybody, anywhere in our family. In fact, uh, that would have been big news to my you know, to some people in our family. So uh, to me, that was a real kind of astonishing pickup that uh, to her, she insisted on it. Uh, and in fact, she also insisted that my father had been there during my NDE. When she said that to me in a reading, I knew it was true, but I'd never gone public with that with anyone anywhere. I'd never shared it with anybody on earth. So it was not known by any anyone in the super Psy family. And yet yeah. she picked up on it uh you know from my father so from his wow. soul uh, so to me that was a very powerful example of kind of the connection i shared with him uh it was a, a, a nice little example of how super Psy really doesn't work at all to explain this stuff uh certainly not in my case um and just it, it showed me that laura lynn was uh, deeply on target with stuff that she never should have had any way of knowing yeah wow thanks I for sharing that man. Yeah, I mean, she she is a very compelling she's a very compelling individual in terms of the mediumship. I mean, you mentioned the Winbridge studies that Julie Baishaw and and the others there have done, and I think she she got something like ninety percent, you know, accuracy or something along those lines. Right. One of the higher scores, and she also did the 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 tests with um, the Forever Family Foundation, um, which are a slightly lesser well known organization trying to study these these phenomena. And I think right. again, she she's verified with them as as an accredited medium, and she again got incredibly right. high scores. Um, and then her personal experiences with Leslie, like Leslie Leslie Kane's sittings with Laurel and Jackson, are just unbelievable. Um, oh, yeah. it's just, totally. yeah. I think Laurel Lynn, uh, she's a beautiful soul. Her heart is deeply resonant with loving others, and that shows through her readings. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've talked all about kind of what happens after we die and that th this whole thing is around it. Um, but I suppose if I narrow that down to get your take again, in a nutshell, just in brief on whether we retain personalities and we talked about it earlier, but memory, do you, do you believe that 
again, it's hard to say for individuals, like whether you will or I will. But in general, do you think that's something that's, that's possible for people to retain memories? And and you've mentioned as well that, you know, with multiple incarnations, which is something I think about a lot. And do you think that maybe in between incarnations, we're able to access everything that we're aware of and everything we've learned in each of those incarnations and then we're stripped back down for the new incarnation if you see what i'm saying um yeah what do you think about all that well i think um i think my my experience of amnesia was very atypical uh you know so i wouldn't worry about that some people get worried that they're gonna hit that same kind of zone of amnesia I think mine was only there to kind of demonstrate some very powerful facts about the brain mind memory and all that uh, mm. that that I would need to have a proper interpretation. But I think by far the most common pattern is that we go in with kind of a full knowledge of our lifetime. And not only that, but once we reconnect with our higher soul in many ways, we become privy to other lifetimes that we've lived that all contribute uh, towards this, this growth and understanding. Uh, it's something I have acknowledged many times in this kind of discussion is what I call programmed forgetting. Uh, that is, uh, you know, if you ask Jim Tucker or Ian Stevenson, the people at, at UVA DOPS who've done all that work with past life memories and children, yeah, they'll tell you, you have to harvest those memories before age six or seven because they're natural processes that cover them over. And yeah. even children who have been very forthcoming with those memories, uh, once they hit that age, they start just not being able to remember them. And that's, I, I would say, the pattern for most of us. You know, as we come into adulthood uh, beyond age seven, uh, uh, we don't necessarily remember all that. I think that program forgetting is there for a reason. It kind of mm -hmm. gives us skin in the game, has us buy into this incarnation as being as important and meaningful as it can be, uh, because it is meaningful. This is where we get the growth done. This is where we get the learning and teaching done, not mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm. That's kind of like that exhale between lives. Um, and so I think program forgetting does serve a purpose, but it's interesting how in many ways near-death experiences kind of circumvent that uh, that whole process because near-death experiencers are more likely to come back to this world remembering you know, yeah. what they experienced in those spiritual realms. Uh, and so, and I would say that in, in the many people who have heart attacks and other things where they come back and have no memories of it, it's not that they didn't have an experience. It's that they don't remember it. Yeah. Uh, and it's recovering those memories that can be so important and recovering the memories. As I've said, I've recovered a lot more than just memories, but certainly other events and kind of features of that beautiful, the realms that I visited during my NDE, I've revisited uh, using uh, sacred acoustics, uh, differential frequency brainwave entrainment for deep meditation. So there are ways to get back there. There's a whole world of transpersonal psychology that I would say is thanks to the work of uh, people like um, uh, Carl Jung, uh, uh, the famous Swiss uh, psychoanalyst, and then of course also Stan Groff, Michael Newton, Brian Weiss, uh, Robert Schwartz, and other investigators who've written extensively uh, about kind of between lives, past lives, and those kind of memories, and how they can be revealed through hypnotic regression, revealed through another NDE, revealed through uh, uh, meditation, through uh, cultivating a sense of connection uh, with our higher soul and with that primordial mind by traversing that veil. So there are many ways that all of us can take advantage of this transpersonal psychology. That is psychology beyond just the personal birth to death, and nothing more, but uh, a person that has lived before, a person that has kind of telepathic connection with others. We just have a much greater access to mind uh, than we would think with the materialist paradigm. And this is something that is borne out through all the empirical evidence of these kinds of phenomena. And that's why it's important for people to educate themselves. You don't have to wait for the scientific community to get up to speed on all this. It's doing that rapidly. But you can take the range yourself through meditation, centering prayer, going within to start to bring this kind of knowledge and healing and wholeness into your own existence. Yeah. And and what you were saying with the the memory and the kind of forgetting the memory intentionally, not 
you know, consciously, intentionally, but on some level intentionally so that you're able to fully immerse yourself in this life. It makes a lot of sense. But obviously, as always, there's exceptions, aren't there, to the rule where like you'd have to say the amount of children that remember a past life, it looks like there would be many more that rem that don't remember it, that have had a past life, that only remember maybe in fits and starts or one little comment here that never even gets picked up on by an adult or never gets put into context. And so it just falls by the wayside. And then you have the other side where there's some children that seem to remember these into teenage years and even into adulthood, which again is is bizarre, like these, these exceptions to the rule. It just kind of um, right. confuses everything. But I suppose, again, memory is very, very individual. Some people have memories of very young childhood um, some people have very few and far between and sporadic memories uh, of, of their earlier life. So, um, right. yeah, it's really, really strange stuff. I'd be interested to ask you um, if you were trying to convince somebody of the reality of survival of consciousness after bodily death and you could only use one aspect of the the body of evidence, because obviously I'm sure we agree that, that the, the main the, the main strength of this is the fact that there is the body of evidence that, that you've got the past life memories, you've got near death experiences, you've got mediumship, you've got all the rest. But if you had to pick yeah one element um, to kind of to say, that's my kind of strongest, that's what I'm going to put my put forward. What would you what would you choose? Well, I think really the whole category of shared death experiences mm. is very kind of underappreciated and underreported. Uh, I know when I first started giving talks about my experience, which is about two years before my book, Proof of Heaven, came out, I would have all kinds of people come up to me after my talks and say, I've never shared this with anybody before, but. And then they'd share a story with me that would change your mind immediately about the reality of the afterlife. These were often after-death communications. Uh, many people have said the greatest gift they ever received from their loved one was an absolute assurance by some communication that happened either during their passing or afterwards that their soul was still here, a piece of information that nobody else could have known that they passed on to someone still living, something like that. Um, but then I started hearing stories that sounded like near-death experiences, but were of people who had been perfectly healthy, like someone out in their garden where their mother was on her deathbed a thousand miles away, and when their mother passed, her soul came through, grabbed their soul, took it along, even on witnessing a full-blown life review of the departing mother's soul. But then the bystander soul comes back to this world. Now, that work was originally, in my mind, of, of what are called shared death experience. That is a healthy bystander soul going along with a departing soul. Uh, to my knowledge, were first named and reported in a book called Glimpses of Eternity by Raymond Moody. I think that yeah. came out in 2011. Now, remember, of course, he wrote the book Life After Life back in 1975 about near-death experiences. And it was back then that he first started to uh, uh, accumulate some of these shared death stories. But it took him that long to get a whole book's worth uh, to report on. Now, since that time, uh, 2011, when Glimpses of Eternity came out, William Peters, uh, who has spent decades in hospice work, um, he, he began with the AIDS epidemic in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area back in the 70s, and he's been involved in hospice work ever since, but he started something called the Shared Crossing Project, and I would highly recommend people check into that. Look it up on Google. Uh, check down William Peters' work because he is doing a beautiful job now of coming up with systems that allow people to go with certain practices and expectations that uh, enhance the possibilities that they might share a shared death experience with a departing loved one. And I think those cases are some of the most powerful to help educate us about the reality uh, of these experiences and that we can participate as sentient conscious beings uh, when loved ones are leaving the physical world uh, through the work of William Peters and others, uh, you know, in the shared crossing uh, kind of initiative. Uh, yeah. to help all of us get on board with this kind of knowledge and this kind of experience so that we can have our own personal experience of a shared crossing with a loved one to help bolster our own knowledge of eternity of soul and the importance of our shared connections. Yeah, that that is a very compelling facet of it, the shared death experiences. That is really amazing. I, I remember when I spoke to Bruce Grayson, he told me, you know, one or two stories of, of things that fall into that category and it's just mind-blowing stuff um right. 
before I before I kind of bring this to a close, Eben, um, I was wondering if you wanted to share your thoughts on UFOs, UAP. It's just a, another of the the main topics that I explore with this podcast, and I often enjoy asking people when they're you know not in the field at all of UFOs. I, I like to get it get the take. You know, what, like what what your thoughts are the same as I will ask people that are involved in UFOs what their thoughts are on on these kind of phenomena. Well, I mentioned it briefly in Proof of Heaven. I didn't expand on it. It was not something our publishers uh, wanted us to pursue in any major way. But I, I talked in there about visions I had during my journey of civilizations as far advanced beyond us as we are beyond earthworms. And in fact, these civilizations are way beyond us in understanding of things like travel through space and time and uh, mass and energy, all that kind of thing. Uh, and what I really was seeing was that humanity now is at a point where we uh, are very close to joining a cosmic civilization, very benevolent uh, uh, kind of life uh, informative uh, group of civilizations far beyond us. And yet the problem is we are, we call ourselves homo sapiens. Sapiens means wise. And yet when I look at all of our developments, you know, as humanity, as a species. There are a few things I can be proud of, developments in medicine, in communication, in transportation over the last few centuries. But I also have to look at the ugly underbelly of our technological progress in the form of our addiction to fossil fuels. Uh, the fact that uh, we are on the edge of a, a, a cataclysm, an abyss yeah. uh, in our ecosystem if we don't take dramatic action now and get rid of our addiction to burning carbon fuels whether it be fossil fuels or biomass, um, we are headed into a terrible situation. There are probably a billion or so species, uh, of mainly of animals, but also of some plants that are, are threatened by our addiction to fossil fuels, uh, our toxic pollution of plastics, things like that. There's a, a gyre twice the size of Texas floating in the Pacific Ocean of, of used plastics that have flowed yeah. down the riverbeds of, of uh, Asia and, and North America and now haunt the mid uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, we are threatening all these species with extinction. What if there were some other species that were slightly more advanced than ours that basically viewed us as just roadkill and incidental you know, damage? Uh, we would be incensed. And that's what Homo sapiens is doing to so many species right now. And from my perspective, that is an extreme violation of what we should be doing to uh, serve as stewards of this beautiful planet that we have been gifted over you know, billions of years of evolution to get to this wonderful state. And here we are in a few centuries, just wrecking every bit of it. We must take responsibility now uh, and proper stewardship of this planet involves uh, ending our addiction to fossil fuels, coming up with much more sustainable energy and realizing we can't just keep ripping everything from Mother Earth and expect that we're just going to get away with it. That's not yeah. going to happen. We're going to have to pay the piper and it's high time we started acting maturely about our use of energy and materials to respect the Earth. Yeah. I absolutely agree, hundred percent, and it's 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 horrible to see what we're doing to it. Really, it's just shame, such a shame. Um, on that though, let me just check with you because you you mentioned you know your vision of these other civilizations. Do you kind of draw a parallel there between UFO sightings and and these other civilizations? Do you think that that could be you know a link there? I think there absolutely could be a link, and and one of my uh, best friends on that is a fellow Ray Hernandez. Uh, I think it's R-E-Y, the way he spells his name, but Hernandez. Uh, and he's he's uh, written some interesting books on exactly that. They call them the contact modalities. Um, but it really assesses this possibility that our uh, the EAP phenomena of these unidentified flying objects could either be uh, you know, civilizations far more advanced than ours that are communicating with us. They could even be humans coming from the future who've learned mm -hmm. the time travel. I'm not exactly sure what the connection is now, but what I saw in my coma journey was a very clear depiction that we are to join that club, but to survive that joining of the club, 
we have to mature beyond the barbaric cavemen that we currently are with this burning of fossil fuels, all this plastic pollution, uh, murdering of uh, species, et cetera. We need to change that way of behavior because we do not deserve to be part of that far more advanced civilization if we continue with the status quo. And that includes authoritarian uh, dictators running certain countries uh, that are, you know, running rough shot over the rest of this world by promoting violence and warfare. Uh, it is time for the people of this earth to realize that those autocrats and dictators uh, are not the friends of humanity uh, and that we need democracies that allow us to really uh, govern this world for the benefit of all and not uh, for the benefit of those few autocrats and dictators. Yeah, yeah wonder whether we'll ever make it i think we we need a new uh, a new way of doing things i think and and i think what you say as well about evolving um you know us evolving to a new level of i guess consciousness is is the way i see it is that we even even on the, the you know an individual level you know people need to just be nicer right to their fellow human and and be nicer to the environment obviously the the grander problems are the yeah the scale of the fossil fuels like you say and and the way governments and and you know right or wrong like how they treat their own citizens and the planet and their priorities it's all way out of kilter with where it needs to be but yeah that was really interesting thank you for sharing that um i guess the last thing i'll ask you today before i let you go um is just if you have any last words or a message for anybody that's been watching and listening um i think the main thing to say is no soul left behind this is a tremendous revolution in human thought that it's been many thousands of years uh, in the making. It's all about the binding force of love, the power of kindness, compassion, and mercy to really bring unconditional t- love to this world at large, to recognize that the apparent polarization and conflict in our modern world is only a fiction of our own making, and that our natural state is really one more of harmony uh, and of resonance and of blessings uh, that we share with each other. And I think that is the best uh, optimal future for humanity. And it's one that each and every one of us can choose on a daily basis to bring into fruition. Thank you so much for today, Ben. Thank you for for your time and for sharing your experiences, obviously, particularly your your near-death experience from your coma, which is just unbelievable, fascinating, and I'm sure it, it lives with you all the time. Um, but yeah thank you i really appreciate it well ben thank you very much for having me on and thanks for all you do to get this out to the world you're doing a great job keep it up thank you to eben alexander for talking with me and thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed it and took something from it please see the links in the description for eben's books and more and please consider subscribing if you want to continue unraveling the universe with us if you want to support us please consider contributing via patreon thank you